There are two parts to Daniel chapter two. And they're very different, so we're, we're going to consider them separately. Today, the issue is God wants to reveal himself in an individual's life. The way he does this is unmistakable. There's no way for a person to say, well, I don't know, I think I ate too much pizza last night. I'm sure that's what it is. It's just, you know, you party a little too hard and things happen, but you know, it's not anything out of the ordinary. I think I'll just leave it and move on with my life. No, God does something in a way that is absolutely unmistakable. And it is so radical how God reveals himself is that it separates those who don't know God from those who do. It makes it absolutely clear. What we're gonna learn about today is prayer. That prayer is for the helpless. And prayer connects a person to Almighty God. The reason why God reveals himself to one person is not just for that one person alone. God's purpose in revealing himself to one person is that through him, he might bless the whole earth. That's why God does what he does. So with those things in mind, let's read in the second chapter of Daniel. Now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. Then the king gave the command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I have had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic. O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will give the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, my decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made an ash heap. However, if you tell me the dream, and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts, rewards, and great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. They answered again and said, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will give its interpretation. The king answered and said, I know for certain that you would gain time because you see that my decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me, there is only one decree for you. For you have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the time has changed. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can give me its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such things of any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. It is a difficult thing that the king requests, and there is no other who can tell it to the king except the gods, whose dwelling is not with flesh. For this reason, the king was very angry and very furious, and gave the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree went out, and they began killing the wise men, and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. There's where we start. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar makes an unreasonable request. And it begins with this dream. Dreams so troubling, he cannot finish the rest of the night. There's no take two aspirin and go back to bed business for him. He is up the remainder of the night. Now, he doesn't ask this dream because he forgot 
the dream. Some people think that, gee, it sort of slipped my mind. You guys kind of jogged my memory sort of thing. Absolutely not. This was something beyond computer animation with 3D Dolby surround sound. You know, this is something so intense. Nebuchadnezzar knows he has never experienced this in his life before. So he calls all the men together who are supposed to have contact with the gods, higher powers, whoever controls whatever this is that we live in. And he has four types here. Magicians, writer or engraver, having to do with magical words and their significance. Also an idea of astrology or divination. The main thing is the access to supernatural knowledge. Astrology being the study of the stars and the planets in order to calculate their effect on human lives. That practice is still with us today. It's in most of the newspapers, online, and it has to do with the position of the stars and their influence on our lives, which is not biblical. Then it says here, sorcerers. These are those who uh, practice magic and aim to control supernatural forces to make them do what they want them to do. So they're seeking power and knowledge but it's not from the one and true and only God. And so this is having to do with unclean powers. So um, Chaldeans then are sort of the loose designation for all of these different divisions of supernatural knowledge and power. And it all has to do with being experts in spiritual knowledge. They have the books, they have the training, whatever training there is, they're the professionals and they work for the king. The king cannot direct an entire empire without guidance. And so he has this whole group of professionals who are in contact with some kind of supernatural transcendent power and authority in order to help him to do that. So he commands them to do something that would prove that they're in touch with transcendent power and knowledge that's above what a human would have. And Nebuchadnezzar figures that if they can tell him the dream, that will prove that their interpretation is right. See, they have all sorts of scrolls and books and things that they can go to and look it up. See, hmm, frogs. If you have a dream about frogs, it means stock market is gonna crash. How many frogs? How bad the crash? Hmm, 21 frogs, not good. Or if you have a dream about who knows what, they're just gonna look it up and they say, okay, puppy dogs that turn into unicorns. Well, it probably means this. You know, it's right there on the level with a Chinese fortune cookie. You will have a good day sometime. Well, thank you, Lord. Good that I got that one because you could never pick that one out. And boy, if it happens, you go, whoa. Let's frame this one and stick it on the wall. Came true. Nebuchadnezzar is not in the mood for a Chinese fortune cookie right now. Does everybody get that? This wasn't a Chinese fortune cookie dream. 
So he wants to know the dream, and then he knows, okay, you got the interpretation. Now, you notice what the wise men say. They, they just say, okay, tell us the dream. This is what they're used to. You give us the information, then we go to our books, we look it up, boom, we give you the interpretation. That's our job. But they're slow to catch on that Nebuchadnezzar is not asking for the usual thing. And finally, they basically say to the king, you are doing something that nobody's ever asked before. This is not the usual thing, your majesty. You are not being fair to us. Not even giving us a hint. But see, this is what happens in life. Don't you think? Sorts of things happen that are not fair, do not color inside the lines. And in these kind of situations, their brand of magic and transcendent knowledge is not sufficient. And they have to admit to the king what you're asking is unreasonable because we don't have a connection to the gods. They're the only ones who know what you're thinking. And come on, they don't live with human beings. They're helpless. They're helpless. And Nebuchadnezzar says, okay, the heck with you. I'm being polite because this is church. He says, you guys are liars, you're fakes, I'm gonna get rid of you, I'm going to rid the earth of you little Chinese fortune cookie pinheads. That's my little interpretation of what's going on. <laughs> it doesn't say that in Aramaic, okay? By the way, Daniel chapter two, right when it says in verse four, the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic, the language changes from Hebrew to Aramaic. And it goes for a number of chapters. We don't get that in our English translations, but all of a sudden, the rest of Daniel 2 is in Aramaic, which was like English is today, sort of a world language. It would be the language that is the court language of Babylon. And it is, like I said, what we call lingua franca today, the language that the entire world would speak in order to carry on business. So they say, you know what? We don't have a connection to the gods and this isn't fair. So you know, Nebuchadnezzar goes ballistic here. And I know I, we don't agree with, okay, let's execute all these fakers, they have to go. But don't you think that if you say you have a connection with God, that you really do have a connection with God? And that that is really valid and therefore you should have a connection to transcendent power and transcendent knowledge. And what these guys are admitting is they don't. And Nebuchadnezzar says, okay, you're done. Let's kill you all. So they round them up and they start to kill them. So now we pick it up in verse 14. Then with counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered Arioch, the captain of the king's guard who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. And he answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree from the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the decision known to Daniel. So Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation. Then Daniel went to his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning this secret. 
so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Now, what I want to call your attention to is the way in which Daniel responds to the very same unreasonable request that the king made of the wise men. He's in their group, you remember. He's part of them. I don't know why, when the king summoned all of them, that Daniel and his three friends weren't there. We're not told. But he finds out about it kind of late. Now, when Nebuchadnezzar says to the wise men, the Chaldeans, he says, tell me the dream. They kind of get huffy. They say, you know what? Nobody has ever asked this thing before. You're stepping over the line. But Daniel doesn't flip out. Daniel doesn't say, man, that is so unreasonable. I can't believe he's doing something like that. We need to blow town. We need to get out of here until it blows over. He just says, what's the reason? What's the hurry for this? And then Ariok tells him, and he goes in and says to the king, give me time, and I'll tell you that dream. Now again, this is impossible, and you gotta, you gotta think about this. Daniel doesn't know what's going on any more than the wise men do. We've read this a bunch of times. We go, oh, yeah, 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 it's God. Yeah, the dream means this. I even know the dream. You know, I can tell you right now. So we read that and don't realize what kind of a situation it's in. Daniel doesn't get this, it's okay, it's me. He doesn't know what's going on. All he knows is that Nebuchadnezzar wants to know his dream. And if Daniel doesn't tell him that dream, he's going to die. And I think he handles it very well, better than I would. I would be packing my bags. There's that place in Nigeria I got to go to. <laughs> I got to do some more ministry there. I got a calling from God. I don't know when I'll be back. But Daniel doesn't flee. He goes into the king and he says, please give me time. And Nebuchadnezzar, who knows his reaction? You want time. You see, he accused the wise men of stalling for time. But he goes into, Daniel goes into Nebuchadnezzar and says, please give me time. And Nebuchadnezzar says, okay. Is that a miracle? So now Daniel sits down with Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, and says, you know what, guys? We gotta pray like crazy because Nebuchadnezzar wants to know what his dream is. And I'm sure they all discussed it. This is pretty dang unreasonable. But we have no choice. We're helpless. So we're gonna go to the God of heaven who is not helpless, who knows everything, and we're going to ask him for help. Now, this isn't the first time that he and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah have ever prayed in their lives. See, they've been going to school. Well, let's even go further back. They were taken directly from being nobles in Judah. They were living their lives in the upper crust and having a great life until Nebuchadnezzar come and besieged the city and took them captives. If they ever prayed in their whole lives, they started then. Because they're totally out of their class, they're out of their element, they're on a trip to Babylon, they're never gonna come home as far as they know, they're hostages. For the next two years, they're going through a rigorous 
discipline of retraining and relearning. And as we discussed in chapter one, they, these four young men, were not about to give up being men of God. So let me suggest to you that this is the time when Daniel and his friends discipline themselves to pray three times a day. Because we learned from Daniel 6 that he was accustomed to praying three times a day since his youth. And I always read that and I think about this. And in my mind, it is clear that prayer was necessary for Daniel to keep his relationship with God alive. And he reckoned that once a day was not enough. Twice a day was not enough. For him, three times a day, praying to the God of heaven, that was sufficient to keep him in touch with God. So in this situation, getting this request from the king, realizing they're helpless, this was not the first time they ever felt helpless. Let me suggest to you that being a man of God, being a woman of God, means being helpless. You cannot make yourself grow, can you? You cannot transform your heart. You can't change anybody else's life. You can't even change your own life. You are absolutely helpless. This is where you are, funny enough, as a man of God, as a woman of God. You begin in utter and complete helplessness. And that's why you pray. Because God is the fountain of living waters and he has everything you need. And so you learn to call on God for everything. Now, you'll know that we're continuing with this prayer book giveaway. That's what's on the back here. Notice this if you haven't noticed that. Um, we're still gonna give them away. If anybody doesn't know about this, sign up and we'll give you this book on prayer. And the reason why is because we have to learn how to pray. And this is a very encouraging book. It's a free advert for Paul E. Miller, A Praying Life. And if you're watching this, Paul E. Miller, we love you and we love your book. We like a few other books on prayer too, but today, it's Paul. Now, I'm reading his book and I'm reading Tim Keller's book on prayer and both of them I find interesting because they both say the same thing. They say right at the very beginning, I did not learn to pray, I had to pray. That's kind of like learning to swim in the 12 foot end of the pool. Throw you in, whoa, look at that. It's a dog paddle. It ain't pretty, but he's not dead yet. Just learned how to swim. <laughs> you see? He's swimming. God teaches us to pray the same way. Pow! Wham! Oh no! God! Oh God! Oh God! God says, lesson one. Very good. Let's move on to lesson two. More troubles. Why troubles? Because they get our attention so quickly. And everything we learn, we remember. This is something I've been meditating on lately and just thinking about how glorious God is in our lives. And it's the combination of several scriptures. The first one is Psalm 71, verse 20, where the psalmist talks about God and says, you who have shown me great and severe troubles. And you never think of describing God like that. 
Oh God, who has shown me great and severe troubles, how I thank you and praise you. If we get great and severe troubles, we say, God, it's broken, fix it. What are you doing? But see, there's a reason why he shows us great and severe troubles. It's in Lamentations 3, verse 33. He does not willingly afflict the sons of men. We think, okay, if he doesn't do it willingly, why does he do it then? And the answer is in Hebrews 12. Because he's our father, and a good father disciplines his children to share his holiness. So he will allow us to go through troubles, and he orchestrates those troubles just for us. That's why everybody else looks like they have it better than you, because nobody else has your troubles. But see, you have troubles that are picked out for you deliberately, specifically by God because that's what's going to make you the person that he's making you to be. They're not random. They're designed by God to make you, only you, that person that he wants you to be because he loves you, because he's a good father. He's the best father. You who have shown me great and severe troubles will revive me again and raise me up again from the depths of the earth because he means to bless us in the end. And this is what Daniel's going through right here. Same thing as you and me. Trouble, great and severe. And he's had a whole two, three years of great and severe troubles right now with no end in sight. In Babylon, you can die any second. All they got to do is just tell the king something he doesn't want to hear. Kill all the wise men right now. That's it your hamburger. So Daniel's right in the middle of great and severe troubles. And so this isn't the first time he's ever prayed in his life, okay? But as he prays to God, it's a, a fabulous thing. You pray to receive from God everything you need God has. And as you spend time with him, you might have the impression, <laughs> this isn't doing anything. I'm just praying. I'm just talking. And my words are bouncing off the ceiling and dropping on the carpet. And that's it. Nothing's happening here. And yet you pray anyway. And what is happening as you pray and seek God and spend time with him, there is something spiritual happening in you. And when you walk away, you are changed because you've spent time with God. And you may not even be aware of it, but you receive clarity of mind. You receive strength in your heart and life. You're spending time with God. It's not just a shopping list. There's something spiritual that enriches you when you spend time with God. And people notice this every time. On Tuesday nights, when we get together and pray, it's like, how was your day? <sighs> well, I'm here, okay? So don't expect anything. And then we pray, and it's kind of like, <laughs> nothing, you know, it's just, this is not good. We're, we're dead on arrival here at Prayer Hospital. It's another corpse. But we keep on praying, and then we're starting to get into it, and we're praying, and we're praying, and we're praying, and we, then we get done. 
And we go, yeah, I'm beat. I got to go to bed. But there's something that happened to us. We're more alive than when we came in because we've been spending time with God. It always is like that. And I bet the women on Friday experienced the same thing. It's amazing how that works. You think all we did was talk to God. What was that? But prayer is about receiving life and strength and clarity from God. It's a vital experience. Now, you know, this main thing about prayer is you are helpless. Completely helpless. So you are looking to somebody who is competent, has all power, all knowledge, knows what to do with it. You are looking to God and then everything else assumes its proper proportion. You walk into a prayer meeting and this problem is going to crush your life and destroy and ravage everything. And when you talk to God about it, you realize, okay, it's a little specky thing in God's hand and if he wants to, he can do that. And he's in control. So you get perspective when you pray. And another thing about prayer is that they believe that God loves them. Sooner or later, when you pray, you have to deal with this essential fact. Is God fickle? Sometimes he likes me, but sometimes it's, ah, get out of here, you bug me. And you have to kind of deal with this again, that God loves me no matter what. He loves me, he loves me, he loves me. That's where you reason from. You go, you know what? I don't know where this came from, but nothing can separate me from your love. Therefore, thank you, God, that you love me. That never changes. And that gives you courage to pray. You don't have to say, you know, God, why do you hate us? What can we do to make you like us again? That isn't Christian. You say, God, I don't understand all this, but I know you love me, so I, please work in this situation and work it out for good, because that's your promise. And you can't lie, and you don't break promises. So you're God, you're God. Now, whatever this thing is, please be in it and deal with it. So, you know, Babylon is overwhelming. That's what Babylon is. And life is overwhelming. Don't you think so? So that's another reason why I know we live in Babylon. It's completely overwhelming. And stuff happens. And we are helpless to deal with it. So when they pray right here, this is one more of those impossible things that they have to deal with. And they do the only rational, logical thing there is to do about it. They pray to the God of heaven. So let's read now verse 20. Or in verse 19, then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might 
and have now made known to me what we asked of you. For you have made known to us the king's demand. And so we pause here for prayer and praise. And Daniel thanks God and worships him, and he has a greater understanding and knowledge of God now. And it comes as a result of prayer. That is, a lot of it is about who God is. And this, to me, is the lovely and delicious thing about prayer, is that through prayer, we get to know God. It's not enough to know about Him. It is everything to experientially know Him, to know that God is near, to know who He is, and to participate in that, to experience that greatness of God. So, blessed be the name of God forever and ever. Name is all that he is, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, overflowing in loving kindness and truth. Blessed be that name because wisdom and might are his. All wisdom comes from God. All power comes from God. And there is no wisdom, no understanding, no power against him. Isn't that a nice thing to know about when you think about all the stupid laws they pass nowadays and especially how they legislate against Christians and they want to make you feel like you had better keep quiet because when you start talking about Jesus like he really exists, we're going to take your job from you. We will crush you economically. You're going to regret you ever opened your mouth when we get done with you. That can just really give you a real chill, sort of like, okay, <laughs> I want to survive in Babylon, but no, that's going to kill you in Babylon. What we really need is this vision and understanding that wisdom and might are His. He has the power. And what he says is wise and reasonable and just. And anybody else who contradicts that is foolish and unjust. And you know what it says here? He changes the times and the seasons. He decides when it's time and when it's not time. He removes kings and sets up kings. How long is that certain ruler going to be in power? Only as long as God says so. And not one second longer. They're not in control. God is. He is the king of kings, the Lord of lords, and we do not have to fear man in whom is one lungful of air at a time but we worship and fear God who lives forever and ever. And then he gives wisdom to the wise, the knowledge to those who have understanding. Do you know who the wise person is? Who knows they're helpless. Who knows there's a God in heaven. Wise men seek God. And he has all light. So there's nothing hidden from him. You know, God doesn't scratch his head and go, man, I kind of painted myself into a corner this time. I don't know what I'm going to do. Oh, well, let's just flesh it and try it again, you know. You know, God will not be painted into a corner. If he gets in trouble and the patient dies, he will raise the patient from the dead. You know, this is really what happened when we had to go to court in Brussels. As far as the prosecutor was concerned, it was an open and shut case. We paid the fine. That automatically forfeits 
the money. So he says to the judge, well, we did make a clerical error and give them the wrong reference number. And so we didn't have on record that they paid, so we made a mistake there. And we fixed that up, we did receive the money, they did forfeit the, the, the 24,000 impounded dollars, and so it's an open and shut case. So the judge says to Dudene, are you happy with that? And Dudene says, no, that hurt. And I tried to give evidence and I was ignored twice. So I felt like for my sanity, I will pay the fine and move on with my life. But I am not admitting guilt. So the judge says to the prosecutor, I think we need to hear this case, don't you? Now, you know what? That, this was dead. And Jesus raised it from the dead. We thought, oh, well, we're just going to watch the corpse for a while for five minutes and then we're done. No. We watched God raise it from the dead and we go, <laughs> you can't do an extreme victory of dance right there in the Palace of Justice in Brussels. But when we got outside, we did. And see, this is the very thing that Daniel is praying about. You know, it could be that God doesn't give him the dream. And the king says, you're dead. And he kills them. And they stand before God. And God says, well done. You didn't flinch. You didn't scream. You didn't do anything that dishonored me. You trusted me, and you were faithful unto death. And see, they knew. You know, if God doesn't give us this, he doesn't have to. He's God. But if he doesn't give us this, we're still not going to knuckle under. Does everybody understand that? Their attitude was, it's God or nothing. So, here God says, Yes, here's the dream. So Daniel says, I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might. You've kept me till now. And now you're doing something so incredible. It's so amazing. Oh, God, this is so good and you're so good. Oh, God. You see, that's worth it. This whole thing about prayer, it's so worth it. So, can you imagine that Daniel gets to know what God is doing in the earth? God is revealing the time plan of the ages that he himself made. And Daniel realizes, I get to be a part of this. I am a servant of the Most High God who's going to tell the most important person on the planet what God is going to do with the rest of existence on this planet. You know, it is amazing to have an, a, rel a relationship with God where these things happen. They're still happening today. There's joy and there's life and there's power in this. This is what you get from prayer. So, you know that God will do things to show who knows him and who doesn't? And if you ask people on the street, you got a spiritual relationship? They'll say, yeah, God and me, we're good. Me and the family are sort of picking up on things that everybody else has done, and we've, we're, we're watching Pirates of the Caribbean stuff. And uh, so I look up about Johnny Depp, and the interviewer actually asked him, you have a spiritual uh, dimension to your life? Johnny Depp goes, yeah, God and me, we're good. Oh, really? Well. God will do things, boo, and 
let you find out. You got a relationship with God? Try this one on for size. It's a great and severe trouble. What do you do with it? That'll let you know if you have a relationship with God. And if you go, not fair, that just calls into question your relationship with God. Because you know, God can do anything he wants. And he does stuff that is absolutely overwhelming and you got a choice. You can say, you know what? That's not fair. That's broken. My life is random and out of control. Or else you say, you know what? You're still God. And I don't understand this. But you love me and you've got to be in this thing and you've got to, you've got to work through this thing because I'm helpless. How you deal with this thing determines your relationship with God. So, yes, God does let these great and severe things happen. But one of the things we learn from this is that in this chapter, God is in control of our lives. God is doing something. And he's working through us, and he's going to bless the whole earth through us. One of the things that happens when we go through these great and severe troubles, and we pray, and God works, is we will tell other people about them, the things that we've been through. And you know that our words have weight and meaning, because we're not talking abstractly like some philosopher on the 22nd floor of some skyscraper who doesn't have to deal with reality. But these are things that we've handled and we've tasted and we've touched and we say, you know what? God is in control of my life. He makes all things work together for good to those that love God, to those that are the called according to his purpose, and that's me. I am called according to his purpose. My life isn't random. And the God who shows me great and severe troubles is going to raise me from the dead. How about you? Do you have any hope after you die? You don't think you're going to live forever, do you? Where are you going? You need to know God right now before you ever get to that place of it's five minutes before I die and I don't know where I'm going. God's going to bless the whole earth through what he does through us because we're authentic and real. And this is how he does it. He saves us over and over and over again. We become testimonies of his existence and his power and his wisdom and his goodness. So, here's how we pray. God, you are God. You're in control of my life. I don't understand this, but you love me. So here's this thing. I'm glad it's not too big for you. Work in this and bring it out for good. And so really, you know what? It's okay to be helpless. You don't have to look competent. The real issue is, do we know God? Do we pray? And I think God is so faithful that we may not learn to pray, but we sure as heck have to pray. We must pray. God's wonderful plan for discipleship. Grow or die. You pick it. I pick grow. Good. We can deal with that one. Good. Excellent. You know, if, if, if up until now you haven't really thought of yourself as helpless, why don't you tell God you're helpless right now? This is it. Shall we pray? 
Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you are God. All wisdom, all power. With all that, you love us. And we praise you for your great, everlasting love. Thank you, Lord, especially for those great and severe troubles. It would hardly be possible to thank you for those things except for what you do. That you do bring us through every severe trouble without fail. Because that's the history of our lives. Ever since you have taught us over and over again, you have saved us and helped us. Thank you so much. And maybe now we're just looking back and realizing it's been you. You're the one who've been, who have been teaching us all this time. So, help us to have that real, honest to goodness connection with you, a real relationship. And those difficult things in our lives right now, we thank you that for you they're not impossible, but they are for us. We're helpless, but we look to you now. Thank you that your power is made perfect in weakness. Now be in our lives, and now be in our difficulties and give us what we need. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. For I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind.